From Chicago's Can TV, a look at the week's events is reported in the newspapers, in the blogs and online, and on radio and TV. This is Chicago Newsroom. And hello again. Welcome to another edition of Chicago Newsroom. I'm Ken Davis here on Can TV. Thanks for joining us today. Um, a good deal of things happening in the news this week that we'll be kicking around on the show, not the least of which uh, what's going on in Springfield with some big changes in education that uh, could have some profound effects and a whole lot of other things. But we start this morning with conferring the uh, much, much coveted and prestigious art cover art of the week award from Chicago Newsroom to the Chicago Reader for this. I think this is a pretty cool cover and it sort of tells the story. This is Rich Daly, private citizen, on his way to Millennium Park for the um, <laughs> World Music Festival in July. I think he's uh, going to be sitting down on Jimmy Buffett's boat in Key West with that outfit. <laughs> so yeah, he's, he's got his little... backpacking man. And <laughs> yeah, he's got his little <laughs> iHeart 312 there, yeah. He's on his way to Margaritaville. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he is in more ways than one, I'm right. sure, yeah. So that that's uh, one of the things we want to talk about today, and, and there are lots of other things. But you know what? It's a wacky place to start, but I gotta tell you, maybe I'm the only person, but I was really bummed out about the the space shuttle not coming to the uh, <laughs> to the museum campus. Well, we got a consolation prize. Yeah, like a 1969. <laughs> it's, it's like getting a 19. 60 Nash Rambler or something. We got the, uh, what is that thing called? The, um, the what do they call no, those I, things? The, I, I yeah, we've both lost yeah. the word. The, 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 the thing I just know it was the second thing. Yeah, we simulator. got the simulator for the, uh, for the uh, planetary. Always coming in second place. I oh, guess. <laughs> right, right. I mean, if, it's not, if we're not getting the Olympics, we're not I getting know. the space shuttle. So. So anyway, Cheryl Corley is joining us today. I forgot to introduce our guest. <laughs> Cheryl Corley is, of course, a Midwest correspondent for uh, NPR here in Chicago yep. and uh, someone who covers the world uh, for NPR with a Chicago perspective. And that's one of the things that, uh, one of the reasons we asked Cheryl to come here today because we want to try to figure out how Chicago looks to the rest of the country right about now. And Andy Shaw is joining us. Andy is now the president and CEO of the Better Government Association, many, many years on TV in Chicago, Channel 7, Channel 5, and uh, now ensconced in a whole different kind of public role, and we're really glad to have you back on the show here again today, Andy. So um, let's, just, let's just dive into this, uh, the big story that's coming out of uh, Springfield today, which I'll, be, I'll go first and admit that it kind of flew under my radar. I really wasn't aware that this was cooking the way it was, and then suddenly it springs on us. Now, that's not fair. The, the guys who cover Springfield would say, we've been trying to tell you about this for months. <laughs> but, you know, a big reform has, has emerged. Well, I've been paying close attention to the, to the reform effort as a piece of legislation. I think what's new uh, and interesting is the fact that this has been done in such a collaborative way that includes the stakeholders. You've got the teachers unions and you've got the boards of education, you have the uh, state educators, and of course you've got lawmakers. And the goal is to finally uh, take some steps that people feel are critical to saving public education. I had a conversation a week ago with a very uh, well-heeled individual who serves on a panel of people who put a lot of money into schools, charter and public, and he said this is the last hope for public education, that if we don't do something about tenure and merit pay and strikes and seniority, if we don't do something about those issues without trying to break the unions in the process, um, public education will never succeed in this city or anywhere else. And that's a pretty strong statement, but I think a lot of people feel that the changes that seem to be in the works in this compromise um, are designed to finally put more emphasis on kids who always seem to be shortchanged. Education in America has always been about the adults, and this is to make it a little more about the kids, which sounds pretty basic, but it's also critical. You know, there's been a lot of uh, um, contention between the states in the Midwest. Yes. <laughs> I noticed that. <laughs> I you noticed yeah, that? Yeah. And I think that this is, uh, with a, a lot of states in the Midwest trying to uh, woo business and all, all sorts of things from Illinois because of the tax hike that was passed in January. And I think this is Illinois saying, uh, kind of thumbing their nose that the states have been kind of piling on and saying, look, we can get something done in a collaborative kind of way. 
when you can't. Hmm. So I, I mean, th if that's true, that's big. That, that is big. And, that is and, big. And, and that that would mean that we might be able to usher in some kind of education reform without having to uh, blame the teachers the way they've been. Yeah, possibly. the teachers have sadly become the, the whipping boys and girls of the education world, and mm -hmm. that's sad because teaching is such a noble profession. My mother was a Chicago public school teacher for Mine 35 too. years. Really? No she kidding. taught at oh. Lane Tech most of those years, really? and she was a yeah. proud member of the Chicago Teachers Union and frequently angry at me when my news coverage, <laughs> uh, in her opinion, <laughs> felt less than charitable to Lane because I covered a lot of teacher strikes. Yeah, yeah. But, but the problem, I shouldn't say the problem, a problem is that the teachers' unions in America, which were so desperately needed to protect teachers from unfair practices and, and wanton disciplinary action by principals who were practicing favoritism, the union that was so necessary to basically make teaching uh, a noble profession uh, became like so many other institutions uh, all about itself and its preservation and its dues and its membership and less about the product at the end of the day which was the kids and I think that 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 has led to the feeling that whether it's tenure or seniority or strikes um, or a lack of merit pay that the component parts of the unions demands tended to run counter to what might be best practices for uh, a more active and a more successful education mm -hmm. and I think the purpose of this this negotiation which seems to be reaching fruition is to restore a bit of balance not to strip the unions of collective bargaining rights or even strike rights or even some of the other basics but to provide a little more flexibility to reward good teachers punish bad teachers have a longer school day uh, make quality teaching more important than length of time in years and I think all those things are according to the experts are necessary to produce better outcomes in the schools. Nobody knows for sure, but it sounds like it's worth a try. And isn't it nice to have Illinois in the forefront of doing it the right way after having been a poster child for bad government uh, with Bogoyevich and George Ryan and so many others? I'm I'm stunned if that's, <laughs> if, that, if we're sitting around the table today talking about Illinois getting but it right. But don't be stunned, Ken, for another reason, and Cheryl knows this too. Um, there are some things happening in Springfield that really do sort of uh, sound like uh, a spring offensive of reform. Now it's slow going, it's slow going, but there's efforts to reform workers' comp, mm -hmm. which has been abused right, right, horribly. Right. There's been some Medicaid reforms that seem to be uh, proactive in terms of uh, saving tax dollars. There is now this education piece. There is a look at pension reform, although that's a tough one be given the questionable legality of changing the system as it exists. Mm -hmm. I think the point is that even though Governor Quinn is an unreconstructed uh, New Deal Democrat who still thinks it's 1930 and FDR is <laughs> the president, uh, Mike Madigan and, and John Cullerton and some of their troops seem to have gotten the memo that it's time to end business as usual and we're making some strides that I think are very commendable from a good government standpoint. Hmm. I have to I have to follow up on that. I mean, who sent the memo? Where'd the memo come from? Uh, you know what? It came from the voters, and it came from a collaborative effort that has been gaining in intensity from editorial writers, commentators, reform groups like ours, and many others. And I guess it would come, too, from just looking at the surrounding states and, and mm. what they're doing, mm -hmm. and knowing that that change has to come. I mean, we're this little island in, in respects if you're talking about the political spectrum you know surrounded we're the by place where all the legislators <laughs> run when they have to run away from their own well, it also comes if you look at the budgets if you look right. at if you look at a, a state with uh, previously a 15 billion dollar shortfall and a city with perhaps a billion dollar shortfall and the county of cook that had to pass this draconian sales tax increase just to balance its budget mm -hmm. and and finally got the memo that maybe that was ill-advised and so they're rolling that one back uh, the national economic men meltdown created a climate in which people no longer had tolerance for the wasteful practices of government a lot of that played out in November at the polls when uh, the president's party uh, took a bloodbath in terms of Republican uh, gains mm -hmm. Illinois was actually an island of, uh, of, of, of difference in that whole Absolutely. sphere. Illinois was about the only Midwestern state where the Democrats maintained a governor's chair and both houses Just of the barely. legislature. Just yeah, yeah. But, I, but I think that the yeah. politicians got the message that the slovenly and wasteful and slothful and many times corrupt ways of all these years 
uh, are no longer sustainable economically, and so that change is underway. And, and, and so did, did the, the, the unions and, and the people who, who have these kind of vested interests, did they look at Ohio and Indiana and Wisconsin and say, wow, we just dodged a bullet here, maybe we need to... Well, I, I mean, I don't, I don't really know what's going on. Well, I mean, I think absolutely. I think what you saw in Wisconsin was that, uh, you know, people being mobilized, and 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 as you're mobilized, you think, well, you know, if if we're going to not have this kind of attack happen in our state, what do we need to do, and how do we need to change? Mm -hmm. And part of that is working, I guess, collaboratively, like we mm -hmm. see with these folks, yeah, to yeah. to get things done a different kind of way. And to, as Andy said, kind of protect your interest. And how do you protect your interest? You don't want it done, you know, kind of unilaterally slashed mm -hmm. by somebody else. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you want to work it out so at least you get some of the things that you want. But back to this overall uh, theme of, uh, of a different approach to government. Uh, Tony Preckwinkle's election certainly uh, heralded a changing yeah, approach yeah, at Cook County. Cook County mm -hmm. Rahm Emanuel, if you believe the things he said in the campaign, is going to run Chicago much more, uh, much more like Preckwinkle in a reform-minded, more transparent, more open way. He's talked the talk. Let's see if he walks the walk. And as I say, there are things happening in Springfield that, that wouldn't have happened a year ago. Now, Governor Quinn, in some cases, has to be brought to the table kicking and screaming mm -hmm. uh, when it does come to changing some things involving unions and worker rights, uh, because even though he is a reformer in some ways, he's never been a, a reformer in terms of the size and the scope of government. Mm -hmm. I think he has always believed that, that government, in its large and very, very generous fashion, is wait, the right, wait, is, wait, is wait. what it should be. Well, well, he was the one who spearheaded the drive to cut down, you know, the state legislature. But, though, many but he, years that's ago. true. He did believe the political process was flawed. I'm just saying that he's been a protector of gov of large government when it comes to the employees who work for government. I think he felt that the politicians were part of the problem, and that was that cutback amendment. Mm -hmm. But remember, he is. This is the guy who just who in the last election cycle uh, signed an agreement with AFSCME not to lay off any workers or close any facilities till 2012 in the face of a state with a $15 billion shortfall. Mm -hmm. That truly ran counter to what virtually every governor in America has done. And even Democrats like Andrew Cuomo in New York and Jerry Brown, who also used to be considered unreconstructed liberals, are really governing like New Democrats, which is, which is a centrist approach, which seems to be probably more pragmatic. <laughs> Well, uh, uh, the President of the United States, POTUS, is in town this afternoon. He's uh, here to raise a bunch of money. It was reported a billion dollars, but they've backed off yeah, from that. Yeah, they've backed <laughs> off. <laughs> backed off big time from that. But lots just of today. Money. Yeah, just today. <laughs> uh, lots of money. And Cheryl, I'm sure you'll be uh, out there covering that for NPR. Um, the, the, um, the, the relationship with Chicago is something that, that fascinates me. I mean, we haven't seen much of him, and he's certainly not coming here bringing any money, that's for sure. He's not, he's not going to be dropping off a, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars for transit project or millions for transit or anything like that. Um, what, what's going on with him? What, what's, what's happening well, this with is the, the This is the go-to bucket, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, um, if you think about where he was able to raise money for the 2008 campaign, I mean, Chicago was it. I think that there was, a, uh, in fact, the the most lucrative place for him was the, the zip code that contains Lincoln Park. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, w only one other place in the country. So I think that, you know, if there's any place where he knows he can get support, it's here in what his adopted hometown. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why he's here. That's why his campaign is here. So they're out of the bubble of Washington, D.C., and in a place that's uh, very, 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 very supportive. But you and mentioned something that we have to pick up on, which is that he has had a very uneasy relationship with Chicago over the first two years of yeah. his presidency yeah, yeah. for very good reason. This is the same city in which the ex-governor Blagojevich was mm -hmm. going to go on trial, right. where Tony Resco sits in a jail. This is the same Tony Resco who helped him get a house at a bargain deal mm -hmm. in Hyde Park. This is the same Chicago where Reverend Wright caused him all the problems in the campaign with the religious over-the-top uh, material, where Billy Ayers, the educator and former radical, uh, created another stir for his campaign, and where, where the mayor, um, uh, a strong supporter of his was under fire in a lot of ways on both mm -hmm. the budget and right. the and the corruption front. Put all that together, 
um, this wasn't a pleasant place to come back to. I watched as I covered that presidential campaign in, in 08, the change in access to Mr. Obama from the beginning when he was always available to when he became viable and we didn't exist anymore. Mm. He didn't want to talk to Chicago reporters mm. because the questions we, we were going to ask <laughs> were we about, know about that it was, side yard. It was next all to the right, house. it was all these things I just yeah, mentioned. Yeah. He would he, yeah. he he enjoyed being being the golden boy to the national press corps. Mm -hmm. And I think even after the election, there was enough controversy left here in Chicago mm -hmm. uh, to make this an unpleasant place to come to very often. Uh, but uh, Arnie Duncan's also in town, I understand. I, am I right about that? Is he, he was here. In town? Yeah. Is he here today? Um, I'm not sure if he's no. still here. Because I was figuring at some Probably gym somewhere be. out on the near west side, there are going to have to be some very high class parking spaces because uh, <laughs> mayor elect, uh, you know, the, well, whole, the whole crowd. Yeah, is yeah. Well, be I thought he was actually going to play a pickup game with Derek Rose <laughs> before the fundraiser. Yeah. And so. you know, That's and you right. know, if he if he beats Derek Rose <laughs> at one on one, you know the fix is in. Yeah, yeah. You know we're back in Chicago and the fix is in. It's but, the Chicago way. There yes, but if he sprains Derrick Rose's ankle, he will lose the next election. Oh. <laughs> well, he could, he could do that without spraining the ankle, but that would guarantee it. Well, I raised the question of Arne Duncan because um, I, I, one of the things that fascinates me uh, more than almost anything is, is trying to figure out, trying to get a grip on where Rahm Emanuel is going to come down on education policy because he and Obama and, and uh, the, for, the, the former uh, school CEO uh, are all kind of joined on the hip uh, philosophically, as far as I can tell, which means more charters, uh, you know, th th those kinds of issues. And uh, I, I just wonder what that's going to mean for uh, Chicago public schools. I mean, obviously, there's a big issue with who the next CEO is going to be. But beyond that, is, is Rahm Emanuel going to be pushing more and more toward what I would call privatization of the school system. Well, it's really interesting, you know, especially in light of this agreement that we were just talking about that was done in Springfield. Um, uh, and uh, he is a big supporter of charter schools. I always think back to that uh, point in the election where he talked about how, you know, if you take out a couple of high schools like uh, North Side and something else, I forget. Uh, that Bobby Payton. You, that, yeah. you know, Payton, that, you know, all of the... Uh, the best performing high schools are charter schools, which was debunked. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> all mm -hmm. of them are, are public schools. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's kind of interesting, the, the push for charter schools. Um, there was a study uh, done by WBEZ which showed that, uh, you know, just the, the results that we're seeing are really mixed. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that these are kind of things that he's going to have to take into account as he determines where the school system is Well, what is he going. promised in the campaign was to empower parents. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, I think what he needs to find out is what parents do want. Yeah, and yeah. if parents want more charters, then he'll probably head in that direction. I would say uh, for an awful lot of parents, what they really want is a better neighborhood school. Well, and that, of course, that? that, of course, plays into what's happening in Springfield. Because yeah. if you believe the educators, and I'm not one, um, but I follow the subject, if you believe the educators, these reforms that are being hammered out in Springfield, if applied to Chicago, have the potential to improve the quality of neighborhoods. And, and, and I, I, I don't want to oversimplify things because it's an, a vastly more complex subject, but in a way, you almost have to have the two things on the table and pick one. You, 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 if, you, if you go down the charter road, you are eviscerating the public schools. I, I'm sorry, I just can't see it any other way. I mean, Ben Jarowski has a piece in, in fact, this reader this uh, this week uh, about uh, the Pritzker high schools and how uh, using Kelvin Park as an example here's a you know kind of a struggling neighborhood school that's up against just insurmountable odds with the with the kind of population that they have to deal with and everything and the kids who are being either thrown out or are involuntarily dropping out of the charter schools are ending up back at Kelvin Park so it's sort of like you know it's not an even playing field and so when you when you then say the charters are just doing so much better than the public schools it's well with a big asterisk they have there, there's a lot of things. Well, you know, the, some of the data suggests that academically they're not doing better, but I think that the other piece of that is I think an awful lot of parents feel that their kids are safer in charters. Safer, yeah, yeah. As they might feel about magnet schools right, because right. it's a self-selecting group of kids and right. parents who tend to be a little more committed to a process. But, um, it, but, but it does beg the question, though, Andy, if we're going to be spending this kind of money and putting these resources, why don't we try to fix what we've got first before you sort of try to build 
Well, the biggest problem separate. here is going to be the lack of money to do any of these things because yeah, the school yeah. board has uh, got the same sort of deficit as the city. Mm -hmm. Look, and the charters have access to money because they've got deep they pockets. They have them deep who pockets, people who are willing to give them. Let to me give just to say, as a citizen yeah. of Chicago and a voter, and not as head of the Better Government Association, because this is not a policy issue that we've spent a lot of time on. It seems to me that uh, that the same business leaders who could come up with seventy million dollars to try to get the Olympics here to Chicago, mm -hmm. which is essentially fun and games and a, and a little residual benefit, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, ought to be enlisted by Mr. Emanuel uh, to put the same sort of effort and maybe the same sort of money mm -hmm. into doing some things for the schools, not just charters. Yeah, well, he's been warming yeah. up the pot by asking him yeah. for money for the <laughs> inaugural, so maybe he can do that. And you so know, the, the only thing I was going to say was uh, it'll be interesting. We'll, we'll see exactly which way uh, is going to happen once we know who he selects mm -hmm. for the CEO. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and I want to say just in my own defense that I, I'm not sitting here just knocking charters, but it's just, it's just when you see the inequality of it all. But Cheryl, this, this brings us to this excellent series that you and David Shaper did uh, on the national scene for NPR about youth violence in Chicago, and, and it really does tie into this because Andy just hit the nail right on the head. A part of a huge part of what parents are looking for isn't even so much the education. It's just can I send my place to a my kids to a place where they're going to be safe all day? Yeah, yeah. You know, this was fascinating to really take a look at this. Um, um, and they gave see. you a lot of time to, to work. Yeah, on we this. did. I mean, uh, we had a lot of time to work on it. It was me, David Shaper, and also Linda Lutton from mm -hmm. WBZ, mm -hmm. and uh, we looked at um, the not only just the problem of, of youth violence across the city, but the efforts. Uh, being taken to try to, to stem the violence. Mm -hmm. And what was so interesting is, yes, people look at the schools and go, oh, you know, God, this must be, you know, we're looking at all these school children and all mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. Most of the young people who are killed in Chicago, and we looked at a frame of kids who were of student age, so 5 to 18, uh, are not killed on school grounds, they're not killed in school or, or shot or hurt or wounded. All of this most of the time is taking place off of uh, mm -hmm. school property. That's a very important and, point. And in the neighborhood. And, and most of the, the violence, peer, it was very interesting because we saw a year where uh, the number of homicides in Chicago last year reached a 45-year low. But what did not change or was the youth violence. That actually increased. Mm. Um, so it's a really entrenched problem in the city and only happening in a small portion of the city. Uh, right. You know, right. we, we, we think there's this... this the uh, Chicago Reporter has done these really fascinating maps by geocodes and everything where you can see that, that it's sort of like there there you want to talk about two Chicago's there's right Chicago right right where there this are, is happening yes, and then there's uh, every place absolutely else. absolutely right. uh, um, the police department for example tracked you know where most of these this violence was happening It was like eight and a half percent of the city mm -hmm. so Chicago depending on where you live well in most of Chicago right. is a safe city yeah it's yeah. just these neighborhoods yeah. where it is I, I, I really want to recommend I know people who um, have gotten through 25 minutes of a show like this on cable TV are people <laughs> who are interested in civic affairs as we are so I really recommend it it's at NPR.org and you can uh, you can just, just Google my Google, name Google and Cheryl Gore Corley or go and to youth the, violence and you'll and see the pop up. youth violence it's really worth um, it's really worth listening to um, but the, I guess what I wanted to ask you instead of you know re recounting the whole series um, did you come away with a changed opinion I mean did, did you did you did you did it convince you that this problem is in any way soluble? And I want to get Andy in on that, too. Well, you know, there was interesting. I, I talked to one expert who said, you know, um, you have to be uh, cautiously optimistic uh, that this is really just a tough problem. And uh, the analogy that he gave was like, you know, we have uh, drugs for cancer, and, you know, we've made strides in cancer, uh, but cancer hasn't gone away. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that's pretty much how you have to look at youth violence. It doesn't too. mean you, you stop doing doesn't cancer mean you research. Stop, or, right, doesn't right, mean right. you stop. Yeah. And there are an awful lot of people out there who are trying to make a dent in this problem, mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and some of them are making a difference. And let me just say that we're, on a, we're, we're at a seminal moment in the city with a new mayor about to take office, and these two key jobs to fill, both of which address the problem that Cheryl and, and her team dealt with, you've got a new police superintendent to choose, a new school CEO mm -hmm. to choose, mm -hmm. both of whom I think are going to have a major role in trying to make these schools and neighborhoods safe. Even mm -hmm. if the violence wasn't in the school itself, the kids 
who are perpetrating it are, are going to school or dropping out of school and kids are, you know there's there's bullying in the schools it's a golden opportunity it's a daunting challenge but a golden opportunity because two individuals uh, who are nameless at this point because we don't know who they're going to be come in with a tremendous challenge but also a, a wonderful opportunity if we get the right people and we have some creative solutions it seems to me that if it is isolated then it's treatable in the same way take the medical analogy we just used if you have an isolated disease it's easier to treat than when it spreads through the entire body so i would just argue that if there are a few pockets of this in the city I'm encouraged because you know where to focus and maybe you can put the resources this there. Gonna, resources is going to be key mm -hmm. and it's going to be interesting to see which of the programs that the schools have implemented will actually remain intact. They're really funded mm -hmm. right now with federal stimulus money. And that's going uh, away. And that's going away. I mean, that's it's one of the things you point out yes, is that there's a lot program. of different programs going on. Right. Culture of Calm and all Culture stuff, of but, Calm. But cool. it's all going Safe away. Safe passages, walking your right. having people right. on the blocks to keep an eye. And, and you know, we've only got about a minute left uh, to open up a whole new can of worms. But one of the things that was so interesting to me about this is the whole thing of the, you know, unceremonious dumping or loss of Jody Weiss, who, to me, seemed as though he was the guy who was, um, he was implementing this idea of exactly what you're talking about, Andy. There is a place in the city that's got a problem that's much bigger than the rest of the city, so we're going to move some resources down there. W Weiss and was then, the, and he got squashed for that. It's kind of an unfortunate ending because as I watched Jody Weiss, I watched somebody who actually grew into the job quite well and by the time he was done, was doing it real well and had begun to repair some of the damage, his early uh, activities. You know, an FBI guy and a bodybuilder um, <laughs> coming in <laughs> as the head of the Chicago Police Department, which is such a, a uh, an old culture yeah. uh, of kind of macho guys and women, types. Um, yeah. I just think you know they did he, the morale was low for a very long time mm -hmm. but sadly by the end he was probably the right guy for the job and then he's gone so I don't well, know. Well, I'm not even talking personality. I'm just talking about the philosophy. Well, what I mean the, is the, he was see, doing... They seem to be backing off on this notion that, that there should be resources moved to certain parts well, of he the Well, he pledged to reallocate the cops and redo the beat system yeah. and it never happened. It was yeah. supposed to be done before Christmas. Here we are in April. Now it's on hold till we have a new police and, superintendent. And uh, yeah, and the interim guy isn't going to do that. So well, no. Terry's just, you know, Terry Hillard, a uh, fine but former e former top cop. But even the uh, but the even the uh, mayor elect says the way we do this is to hire more police it's officers. To hire more police, right? And that's where we're going to have to leave it. What an interesting discussion. I'm so glad to have had both of you on the program today. Had a whole list of things I wanted to talk <laughs> about, and you know what? It wasn't even worth it because it's just interesting to. Well, that's why they invented next week. <laughs> yes, that's <laughs> next week on Chicago Newsroom. We'll take that up and more. Thank you so much, Andy Shaw from the Better Government Association for being with us today. And I'm sorry we didn't talk about all the stuff you guys are working <laughs> Can on. Can I just say bettergov.org? Bettergov.org. Bettergov.org. Yes, there you go. Check out everything we're <laughs> doing at bettergov.org. Cheryl Corley. Become, right, a member. Right. Become a member of BGA if you want to help us in our <laughs> fight. You have this is my <laughs> pledge drive. Let's see, who has, let's see who has the best better pledge drive. That's right. Andy Shaw, <laughs> Cheryl Corley joining us here on Can TV, CanTV.org. You can see us, by the way, on Can tv.blip.tv you can check us out there and you can see us on uh, YouTube and uh, you know we're, we're sitting on Andy Shaw's front lawn uh, doing the show sometimes you can see us there glad you joined us today and thanks so much we'll see you next week with another show here on Chicago Newsroom on Can TV thanks bye